Talk Show. It's the Daily Talk Show, episode 596. We've got Victoria Devine in the building. Hello, friends. Welcome to the show. It's uh, it, We're recording this on a Friday and mm-hmm. this is our first time that we've got wine on the show. I feel like I'm hosting an event. Like this I'm, is an yeah, event. Yeah, this is it's great. It's a wine tasting because there's multiple <laughs> bottles. Yeah. Well, well, you've got a couple of guys who know nothing about wine. Mm. Oh, so. I'm really, I'm really worried that you expect me to know, but I will have you know, <laughs> in a previous life, I was a sommelier. Really? You were yeah. really? Yeah, legitimately. How? Yeah. What, like um, fresh out of school? What? You, I mean, yeah, how eighteen long years take? old was working on the Mornington Peninsula because that's where I grew up, and turns out the sommeliers got paid a fair bit more than the um, the waitresses, so. Figured I'd do the two days of training and then I started telling a lot of people on the peninsula which wines to drink. I mean, oh, I was going to get a peninsula one too, but then, <laughs> but we'll get to that. You went, you went across the ditch and over yeah. to New Zealand. Yeah. Um, at 18, being a similar, how do you say it? Similiar. Similiar. Yeah, you got to say it if you want to do it. Is it the same as a life coach at 18? Look, not much life experience, <laughs> not much time spent with the drop. You know? I, I do believe it was a lot more impressive sounding than it actually was. Because okay. mm-hmm. working at a specific winery, you actually got to know what everybody else said about the wine. Okay. And at 18, <laughs> I didn't drink red wine, so yeah. I'd just make it up. Were you? Uh, do you think you're a good storyteller? Oh, absolutely. And so, I mean, it's that plays into it. Very fruity palette. It's, so it's just, it's <laughs> just really fruity. dropping in some wisdom. Well, what we're going to do is, uh, Josh, you explain what you've got mm-hmm. and then I want Victoria to sip it and give us her sort of take on it. Okay. Just the highs, the lows, so or did, the notes. So did you I want told me to- you, I just made it up. I'm going <laughs> to yeah. do this once again, but hopefully I can get a rating on how yes. convincing I am. All right. And okay, nothing yeah. says more posh than the water droplets on a wine glass that's <laughs> just being washed. Um, I mean, it wouldn't have it at, at Voudemont. And so look, you, at, lo- at least it's not someone else's lips. Yeah, exactly. And this, these are brand new, actually, these yeah. glasses. Just really bought from Woolworths that. Abbotsford yeah, yeah, $15 yeah. for four. All right. <laughs> So what I'll do is I'll just – can I tell a little story for each one just very quickly? Are you going to make the story a, up or you're actually No, 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 no. It? So yeah. I just got, I oh, got this one. terrible. I just got this one because I'll tell you why I bought them. Okay, that's all right, good. All right, that's all right. I love that. So I'm there ready. was a yellow tag above both of these. The recommendation one or no, the sale? No, the sale one? tag. <laughs> yep, I'm here for it. <laughs> yeah. And so this, uh, this is a um, South Island. What I liked about it was I love anything coastal and it said island on it. And so the blue I really like and the wine that I normally get has a blue label. The wine I normally get was double the price of this. So I decided to get two different types of wine. And so I've got that one. And then I've never had... So you got two for the price of one. Yeah, but for, two yeah. for the price oh, look, of his one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. On my podcast, we have money wins. I think that but, that is the money right, winner. You for haven't sure. tasted it yet. No, I'm here for <laughs> money win is more alcohol. Okay, perfect. Quality. All right, great. And so this one is an 8%. Alcohol, if you, if that means for anything. I mean, I don't think do people who drink wine look to the alcohol content and say like, I don't believe so. Yeah, would you I mention mean, it, Victoria? Th- the in- bogan looking at the Jim Beam to see if it's the extra strength one versus mm. a sophisticated mm. person drinking a. I mean, drop eighteen-year-old sommelier me was actually looking at double blacks and <laughs> yeah. going, "This is <laughs> yeah, yeah, bang yeah. for my buck." Yeah, yeah. Um, not this at shit. I get the red. Yeah. I get the percentage in one bottle. Yeah, no. Small three seventy-five mil. And so this is a French one, which seems sort of outrageous because red wine. I don't, I don't connect with France, but maybe it is a big thing. No, it, it is. It, it is, is massive a big thing in France. Yeah. Oh, whoops. But it does. <laughs> <laughs> it says here. Um, that, that's actually what they're known for. Uh, and they fact, know, like, like sh- I went to Champagne. Wine and cheese? I yeah, went yeah, to the they're Champagne known for region. Champagne, but they definitely have a very large amount of regions that have red wine. Okay, and so right. this this one does. And so it's a uh, uh, I haven't described them. It, this one's a Pinot Noir La Forge Estate, uh, Sud de France. That's All right, twenty eighteen. And crack so one of them. Yep. And Which so just really you? quickly, one uh, quick observation is that the uh, that one's backwards. Yeah, this, no, the South Island one is a lighter colour. Well, I, I don't well, think we don't you know, know that. what the glass looks like. That looks yeah, yeah the glass is different. black. But I feel quality wise, potentially we, we won't. Do you know how you can tell quality wine by the screw cap? Really? Oh, obviously. And so like, the screw cap means that it is much cheaper than a corked wine. Okay, great. Yeah. I don't think I've ever opened a cork one before. So actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah, my my uncle tells a joke and he says. He got a bottle sent over. He said, excuse me, waiter, come over here. He says, can I help you? He said, "Uh, this bottle is screwed. Take it back. (laughs) It is meaning the screwed. Oh, that's funny. 
Um, so what I'll do... Does he get a laugh? Or do <laughs> yeah. you just get yeah. up and walk out of the restaurant? No, nah, right. no, I give him the laugh because <laughs> I'm usually pissed at that point. No, <laughs> do, you, no. do you have um, go-to jokes uh, being in finance? You've got the podcast, she's on the money. Do you have well, I go-to... Think what, com- stereotypes or like um, areas you're playing in the... Fi- like in money stuff. Or money banter. What's good money yeah. banter? What <laughs> do people get what around? I don't know what good money banter is. Maybe yes, if we just ha- have banter, feel, it'll come out. Yeah, I just feel like it's all about money habits and just mm-hmm. talking about like your bad spending. Sure. I've got, like, I've got the one The meme for you. I put on Facebook yesterday was about balance. Like you spend $1 on a bargain something and then $3,000 on a trip to Europe or something. That is yeah. good I feel like it's always like the comparison yeah. of people going like, oh, I got a bargain here, so I splurged over here. Where oh, do yeah, you yeah, spend yeah. money, Victoria? Oh, Where do you spend your most amount is, of money? This is not great. Um, I would say on food. Honestly. Yeah, same. Uber oh, Eats food. or are you oh, I'm going so out? I'm so good at Uber Eats. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> I'm so good at yeah. Uber Eats. Thai food. Yeah. Um, they know us now. They write really nice messages. <laughs> really? On my oh, Uber that's Eats nice. Tags. Um, it's something I'm trying to rein in. That was actually one of my 2020 goals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like Do you act. give yourself a budget in regards to how much you will spend? Give, I, give I that try. a sniff and sort of a swirl. This is beautiful. And there you go. I just did small ones to start just so everyone can have you a call thing. this small. This is like a legitimate glass of wine. Really? They, they, Some um, of us have to drive home. It's, oh, that's right. <laughs> but that's I, all right. That's it. That's it. I've just got to walk home. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> With two you. bottles so in cheers, hand. everyone. Cheers. Cheers, oh, cheers, cheers guys. Cheers, cheers, guys. Here's to the cheers. first wine Friday. Okay, here we go. Yeah, first this wine needs fr- to be a thing. Yeah. Well, we, well, this is going on the weekend, but I think at the end, of, because we do seven shows in five mm. days. It's impressive. We... Um, Pretty finishing record. the work, yeah, finishing yeah. the week, the last show should yeah. be with wine. That's a great yeah, I idea. I feel like Sunday sesh, that's a thing. Oh, yeah. tied in. And the uh, air con helps with the red wine. If it was hot, like if it was as hot as it is outside, yeah, it would be, it'd be bad. Mm. All right, so we're sipping. All right, I want right. to get your thoughts on that, uh, sommelier. Uh, Victoria, your birthday, this is kind of finance banter, is on June, June 30. 30. Yeah. <laughs> Classic. Yeah, like I, I'm also the daughter of an accountant. So yeah. I just feel like. <laughs> that is so funny. That's good banter on your parents' end. Yeah. Just like, yeah. Had a little baby. Honesty, no. got her, you know, got the expense through before the end of the financial year. Yeah, no, look, my dad wasn't actually very impressed that that was wasn't my it? birthday. He oh. had to leave work. Oh, he was a financial oh, yeah. controller at the time and he was just like, this is not on. Yeah. This is absolutely it is not annoying. on. annoying. Yeah. It's like having, so if you're sorry, a footy dad. player, you're having a kid on grand final. Yeah, that's rude. Mm, that you baby needs to wait. To. <laughs> do, do, have a, have a t- taste. I've, I've had a sip. It's pretty nice. Good work. Oh, I don't know if it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, I, I might. Wait. So I had the the one that I get is like a, I don't think this, I don't know much about wine. I'll say that. But oh, what all I will I'm say is. You, you all knew I, the colour. That's yeah, pretty yeah. good. The thing is that the the one that we normally get is like an organic one or whatever. This has something to it. Maybe it's all psychological, but this has like a. Tannin. If you've if you if you've had tannin, so tannin. you can feel it on your tongue. Is that good? Ah, oh, some people like it. If you've had good. one sip, I think you need to go for another because the first sip, like you've got a fresh palate and mm. you're hitting with, with wine, and then you need to go again just because mm. it will have had it on your taste buds, mm. and so now it'll probably so taste you, different. You need a job. Yeah, like, let me introduce you <laughs> to some of my wine friends. <laughs> Did you have to like get dressed up being a silhouette? Cilim- c- cilim- how do you say it? This is why you don't make fun of other people who can't <laughs> say it, mate. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Silhouette? Similiar. Similiar. Yeah. Um, do you just wear like... I like, mean, I wore the clothes that the restaurant gave me. Okay. It was a beautiful white shirt, black pants, okay. apron, very, very restaurant. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Max, can you just ride the mic slightly? Thank you. Um, it's uh, yeah, I mean, but the, what, so what winery did you work at? What I was worked it? at Red Hill State for a while. That's oh, lovely. That's good. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. and at Crittenden as well yeah. for, a, for a fair while. And so was this before you were thinking about getting into the finance game? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I worked as a waitress while I was in my teen years because mm. there's not much job opportunity on the Mornington Peninsula yeah. when you are 16 and want some financial freedom. Um, surf club. I mean, surf shop. Yeah, look, do I look cool enough to work <laughs> I, in the shop? I can see shop? you in a pair of reef, yeah. uh, what do you call it, trackies? Yeah, a friend look, of mine. No, they were trigger trackies. Anyone trigger, that's from oh, the yeah, Morning trigger, Peninsula trigger, knows, sorry. your trigger trackies, your Havanas and your Bond singlet, yeah. that was our our uniform. That's um, Pete Shepherd, a friend of ours. He lived live down in uh, Torquay? No. Uh, no, um, Ocean Grove. Ocean Grove. But he says he loves the that sort of get up too. Mm. Yeah, that was he his must get be up. a great bloke. Yeah. He knows his stuff. Yeah. I like him. And so, what did you? So, your very first job, what what was it when you were? Very, very first job. Yeah, very first job. 
Um, my parents, this is very left field. My mm-hmm. parents actually bought me a business when I was 14. Amazing. Um, they bought me a coffee cart because yeah. they wanted to teach me business skills and life skills and mm-hmm. how to do the books. Yeah. And they bought me this coffee cart and I had to work out which markets I was going to take it to on which weekends. And I had to work out how much coffee cups were going to cost me and how much coffee and milk would all cost me and I had to budget to buy soy and how much I was going to charge on top because soy was more expensive. And my parents were amazing. They mm-hmm. helped me do all of this. And my mum would come around to markets and set up with me at 4.30 in the morning and then I employed my little sister to help. I made next to no money in this, yeah. honestly. But yeah. I think that's where my love of businesses and starting businesses started because I remember the first time I was like, oh, mum, I'm going to get my sister to help. Like she's going to, you know, work in this. And mum was like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. You're going to pay her though? And I was like, damn. <laughs> I love this. this. You had payroll going. So, yeah, I had payroll going. And then after I'd paid for everything and I'd paid my little sister and I gave my mum a, a wage, yeah. um, I got to keep the profits. And then mum would be like, all right, well, you know, it's coming into summer. Do you want to buy a market umbrella or something and some chairs to go with I your love this. thing? And I'd be like, yeah. She's like, well, that's what comes out of profit. You've got to work out. Yeah. you know, where that's coming from. And so I pretty much just didn't earn any money and was just developing this little business. And then VCE kind of came up and I sold the business to my sister. Yes. And then my mum and my sister did this and that's where my sister, Lauren. And now it's the coffee this. club. No. Yeah, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> That'd be great. I mean, no. you, were, you were selling Xboxes between you and oh, your brothers. Yeah, no, yeah, well, that Vic's was... over here selling coffee, coffee. business. Yeah. So no. I'm also really good at coffee and that's now in great. our office we had like a full coffee machine. Everybody in the office has been to barista training. So, oh, wow. Simpler yeah, times. Very, very serious. Simpler times when you would have done it. Like now you have to... People are asking for almond milk, but then they need to make sure it's milk lab. There's like a lot of sort That's of. That's me. I'm sorry. I feel, yeah. I no, feel I'm, personally victimized. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I can 100% relate. Do you relate. have oat milk? Uh, I've, I have sometimes have oat milk, but I just got so much into the sort of the milk lab and just yeah. asking people, have you got milk lab? I saw it on Instagram, a good comparison a snapshot, you know how they do, you know, you get like yeah. and what are they milk saying? lab versus something else. There's a bunch of shit in mm-hmm. milk lab. Well, apparently. that's how they keep it all together, I guess. But yeah. this other one that was like, I hadn't tried but it, it probably. No, I don't like it. I've seen that advertising You've seen it and too? I tried it and I'm very much a like organic Yeah, because it's person. literally water and smash nuts. <laughs> yeah, and, and it really separates out yeah. and it looks yeah. really gross. So no, come at me, preservatives. <laughs> they, they've nailed it. And so that was first business. Yeah, when VCE, I was 14. Obviously you, you, VCE took a step you, back. <laughs> great exit. Uh, Capitalised. You've been retired <laughs> since, right? <Yeah>. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It was called My Coffee Card. I was really original yeah, yeah. in the naming conventions there. Um, then I started working as a waitress at one of the wineries on the yeah. peninsula on the weekends and yeah, I went from there. And then when I turned 18, they offered me the wine training. So I did that all through university and then I'd come home on the weekends, do that and then go back up to the city and yeah. Do you find that there's being a young person who was having their own business, is there a certain thing that stood out to you that sort of is different for the experience of a young person? Um, I think having control so young gave me a feel of wanting to continue that control. And so when I started to be an employee in other people's businesses and seeing things that I wanted to change or do and knowing Mm. that I didn't have the power to do that kind of frustrated me. So it was a good and a bad thing. Like Mm. I wouldn't be here if my parents hadn't given me that opportunity, but I also wouldn't, yeah, I'm just a really bad employee, (laughs) honestly. No, I mean, do you think that's a consistent across Mm business owners because I would agree bad employee but how good is that I'd be business? a terrible <laughs> yeah I'd be a terrible employee yeah. honestly well, um, yeah because I mean that's where but then I think that we're in a time where people are feeling like based on external pressures everyone's sort of doing their own business thing mm. and so the, that's where you could be a great employee and then you're giving this pushback because you're like oh, no nah, I don't want to be labeled as a good employee well you see this you see the um the side hustle stuff, you see that there's sort of that expectation that you need to be entrepreneurial mm. and that's almost like it's it's become a bit of a status symbol. I, I think guess. it's unnecessary though. It's yeah. like such an unnecessary pressure and I think there's such value in having a really good job that mm. pays you well and gives you sick leave and gives you annual leave and enables you to live the life that you want. I feel like that's actually in this day and age so undervalued mm. because it gives you the freedom to create the life you want and you don't have to be an entrepreneur and you don't have to have a side hustle but it's one thing to be that and it's another to be something else because mm. I think that 
own now in the age of Instagram and like seeing what everybody else is doing, it's so shiny. Mm. Like it looks so pretty to have your own business, but mm. it's full of stress. It's full of everything that, you know, you don't see. It's, yeah, it's a lot. And so you started your financial advising busy, biz, busy. Business. Uh, business after I was trying to be cool, guys. Um, I'm always trying to be cool. It's just not so you finish your uh, uni degree. How long does it take uh, um, to do a financial? So I did a advanced diploma of financial advice or financial planning. Sorry. No, you're right. Um, but I did like some degrees before that that gave me some credits to be able yeah. to do that. Um, so I actually started in psychology and then was working in psych and then did a postgrad in psych and then did my MBA and then got into finance. So, well, so is that a long way? Is that a long road? It seems like a long road. <laughs> it, it? it was about mm -hmm. eight and a half years worth of study. Yeah. Wow. So the psychology of finance. Yeah. Within so interesting yeah. to me. Yeah, well, you, yeah. what, your first episode on She's on the Money was about your money, money story, yeah, yeah, which yeah. I love. I sent it to my wife. Don't think she listened. Oh, well. I'll have a go at it tonight. No, 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 don't even. <laughs> <and> I will. <laughs> no, because I think it's so relevant around, I mean, everyone needs to work in some capacity or they need to live. You need money to live. Absolutely. And so it's like if you dig deep, and sort of what is that exploration for most of the people you're working with? Or what did you learn in sort of the textbook uni area about that stuff? So doing – or doing psychology and doing finance was so completely different, but I feel like I actually use my psychology uh, I feel like I use my psychology degree more now mm. than I did before. So I was working in the space of culture and engagement and the thing yeah. that came up all the time was like, Victoria, it's not actually my job, it's the fact that I've got a mortgage to pay. Mm -hmm. or, Victoria, it's not my job, my wife's having another baby and we didn't plan for this and, you know, I'm feeling financially stressed and I felt like there was this massive roadblock of me having these conversations. But I could also see that if I could have that conversation with that person and I could help fix their financial situation, how much better off they would be mm. because psychology is fantastic and I love everything about it. <clears throat> Sorry. The wine. It's the shit wine. It's the I'm shit sorry. wine. Honest <laughs> to God. Oh, guys, I don't know um, what you guys are talking about. <laughs> is it good? Is I, like, it, I really you actually like it. Like, no, it I, I quite like it. It's no, where no, is it, it from? Central it, Otago. No it, it, no, it is actually. It is good. It's not bad. <laughs> God, he's had a few sips. He's got it in his blood. Yeah. He's now loving it. Give me a little bit more. I've got to I walk I think he's on. had a little bit more than a few sips. Look how empty his glass is now in comparison. <laughs> I don't, I'm a bigger guy though. Oh, All right. Then who? <laughs> I don't know. Both of you. I don't oh. know. Go on. It is sorry. Sorry. I don't even know where this I was. Is was it was. Was. This is my last. Mine was a nightmare. This is terrible. I told you no. No, I no, told me this would happen. It's great. You were really no, pushing it, Josh. No, let's just um, get all the wine into him. It'll be great. No, no. Well, I think so. Then, okay, your uh, financial advisory course. What was the name? Of, what was the actual? An advanced diploma of financial planning. And and are, you, are they thinking about the what's your money story? Are they using no, the, this no, terminology? No, no, no. We're, we're like just, just talking about finance and what this spending. is and yeah. like, yeah. It's definitely not talking about that and that's something that I'm really passionate about in this industry. Yeah. It's getting people upskilled in the space of psychology because the biggest thing for money is actually how you feel about it. And mm. you can't change your money behaviours or your thoughts or beliefs if – you aren't bought into it and you don't see mm. the value in it. So if you can connect with your clients on a level that is like, no, he wants the best for me and I want the best for me and this is my path, you're going to mm. be better off than a financial advisor looking at your finances and checking out your bank account and being like, all right, well, this is the plan that you need to, to make. Mm. Do you think it's shifting from the days of accountants and financial advisors looking at shit black and white? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I also see a massive shift in this industry of all of these advisors and accountants and and, you know, mortgage brokers coming into one house. So it's kind of like a one-stop shop instead of going to your accountant and then going to your dad's financial advisor. Mm. It's very much like you have your finance person and you go to that one relationship and they will work everything out for you. Mm. How much have parents fucked this all up <laughs> in regards to the education? I don't think they've fucked it up. It's uh -huh. a bit dramatic. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> they're doing well, the best they can. Well, I guess like a lot of people are coming with warped perceptions of mm. money and that's yeah. got to have come from somewhere. Money stories, yeah. right? So the way we grew up and the 
behaviours and the experiences we had are obviously going to shape our perception of money. And if you grew up in a family where money was quite tight, you're probably going to have those behaviours regardless of what your job is in the future Mm. because it's ingrained in you to feel stressed when money comes up. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas if you're in a position where you grew up in a wealthier family and money wasn't an issue, I actually see a lot of clients who are getting into debt because they're going out on their own, getting a credit card and just spend happy because mum and dad were spent happy, Mm. but they didn't see the work that went into creating the wealth that enabled their parents to be spend happy. So I think if we want to dive into where parents are going wrong, it's not having open, honest money conversations with their kids from a really young age. It's getting them on the page that they can start talking about money and going, all right, well, you're five, but like that's what this costs and I work for this because there seems to be a perception that money is everywhere for children Mm. and it's just, oh, well, mum and dad will organise that, but they don't see that you actually have to go to your job to earn money to then allocate it to something. How many people are obsessed with money and where do you fit on the spectrum? I guess in the financial sector, there's probably a lot of people who see money as the thing, the destination, the thing that we're all working towards. Where do, where do you sit with that? I see money as a tool. It's a tool to create the life that I want and it's going to give me the freedom to make the decisions and create the lifestyle that I want. Um, unfortunately, I'm not a money motivated... Unfortunately, I'm not a money motivated person. I can see it as... A, or I see it as an indicator of success. Mm. Like obviously if you're making a lot of money, you must have done something pretty good and you've worked really hard for that. So I do see even the revenue in my business as a reflection of me doing the thing that I said I was going to do. But I get a lot more gratification out of people saying like, oh my gosh, you've changed my relationship. I feel so much better about this. But I think that's because I'm not the standard financial advisor that came in and said, I want to give financial advice. Like I kind of fell into this because... I was so passionate about psychology and helping people that it made sense to move into this. And I kind of came in left field with a background in another career. So for me, it's always been about helping people and getting them on track and feeling a part of their journey. And I love that, but I don't see that in a lot of people. But in saying that, I've met so many financial advisors who are so fantastic and on the same page and they've had no training whatsoever. They just are, it's innate for them. Mm. What about uh, home ownership? I guess in Australia... Uh, there's always the, it seems like a lot of people have the goal to own a home. It seems like in 2020, it seems like the a, Australian dream. it's the Australian dream, but it seems harder than ever to actually like it's a pipe dream for many. Absolutely. What's the reframe or how, how do you look at home ownership? Well, it depends on why that's a goal of yours. Is that a goal of yours because your parents owned a home? Like what is the stagnant point where you are saying that that is what you need? Is that what you think is going to create you wealth? Um, and often people are saying like, well, I need to buy a home. I need an investment because I need to retire one day. And it's like, well, maybe that investment isn't property because it's actually not viable for you anymore. Like, are you going to come up with $200,000 to buy in this area? Like, mm-hmm. You're not going to get an asset that actually increases in value to the same extent that it has for your parents. Like even I got that from my parents a while ago. My dad purchased his first home for like $17,000 or something mm-hmm. and it's worth a whole heap more, he sold it, but worth a whole heap more now. It's like I don't actually have access to property at that type of level to have that capital growth. And if the capital growth of Australia and the property market in Australia continued in exactly the same way that it has over the last 30 years, it's actually unsustainable. Mm -hmm. We'll have people in Melbourne needing to purchase like apartments right now that are $500,000 for $3 million and now uh, income isn't going up at the same rate. So like the rate of inflation is absolutely not keeping up. So it's an asset that needs to be reconsidered. And why do you want that? Like, don't get me wrong, I get wanting to own your own home and have that. But like, what is your wealth creation strategy? It's not just property. Yeah, because the previous generation to us, our fam- our parents and their generation are retiring asset rich, a lot of them. Yeah. So they don't actually have heaps of cash, maybe some super before they access it. But then they, my parents have Downsize. an asset of a house. Yeah. But then that's their retirement. Mm as well as their super. Yeah. But then for us, like our generation, if we're not able to, like what does that look like for us? I mean, are you I thinking like about I this? I feel like I see it a little bit differently. Um, I don't want any of, I don't want to be in this situation and I don't want any of my clients to be in a situation where their primary asset is their family home that they mm. have then brought their children up in and they get to 65 and they do go, all right, I want to retire, Victoria. And I go, okay, to retire, you have to sell your family home. Mm. I don't want that. I want you to live your best life in your family home that you've worked so hard for and probably done heaps of renovations on and made it perfect for you. I want you to have that asset and have another asset that's paying you for retirement. So I think it's 
it's an interesting thing and you see a lot of people in their late 50s and 60s who are asset rich and need to downsize to a different property to be able to afford retirement. Mm. And that's just not what I want for my clients. It's not what I want for my life. If I buy a property and I make it my property, I want to keep that. I don't want to have to then sell that so that I have financial freedom. I want to create that independently of the properties that I own. Well, I mean, I I even, I look at that asset rich, like that's a good situation out of the opposite situation, which is I don't even fucking own an asset and I'm 65 yeah. and I've got Uber fo- Eats isn't 300 an grand of super mm. and what I've got to go mean? on the... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Unless you own equity in Uber Eats. Yeah. Oh, well, but in they're, that they're, case. they're not a profitable business as uh, yet. Unless I'm con- collecting all of my um, paper bags. <laughs> yeah, we gonna... could sell that. Like, like, <laughs> yeah, let's definitely. head on down. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so, but then you, um, yeah, and then you're going on to pen- the pension as your sole income as an elderly person like that's scary but that is a reality for a lot but how lucky are we to live Mm. in a country where we have we have access to a resource like that so Mm. that if you're at a point where you need to retire because you can no longer work we actually have access to a resource that supports us in doing that Mm. so i think that we are great or i am grateful for that but i also never want to be in a position where i need to access that personally Mm. i think that there is a place for it absolutely but i also think that you know, we should be working as young people to create wealth over the long term, but we don't see the value in it because we just think it's so far away. Like mm, retirement yeah. isn't that far away. We look at our parents and it's they have these conversations with us all the time. They're like, when I was your age, and to them that was yesterday. Mm. So we need to be thinking about this now rather than, you know, 30 years down the track, like the priority is now. And I guess that's why I'm so passionate, like wildly passionate mm. about financial literacy and just understanding that you have so much power now. What about all the trends that are coming through? That like I've I watched a documentary on fire, financial, oh, yes. financial, financial independent, independent retire early. early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. I, yeah. <laughs> and I've got <laughs> like, and and so all of these different things. Like, where does it sit for for someone who is? Oh, it's such in the a industry. spectrum. Oh yeah. my yeah. gosh! Like, I have so much respect for mm-hmm. the financial independent retire early movement. I could not do it personally. Mm-hmm. Like these are people who are saving like 80, 90% of their income. Yeah. They're freezing burrito, breakfast burritos. <laughs> and I did it for, I made a batch it? of. Yeah, it's beyond that. Uh, well, the thing is, yeah, I was, it was almost like a trial because I was doing that, but then still having Uber Eats. Like I wasn't eating breakfast. So I started eating breakfast burritos to see what it was like, but it's. The clusterfuck, yeah. they go a little bit soggy when you. Gross. Yeah, you have to, and they the, the take saving like their wage. It's not the. It's not just the burrito bit. Yeah, that's making. But that's what I, was no, I just feel like burritos isn't the key to the <laughs> yeah, independence yeah, yeah. movement. Yeah, definitely not. No, but it's the retire early bit. Yeah, <laughs> if I. All right. So well, what I'm getting here is the financial advice is eat a frozen burrito, you get to retire. Yeah, it's, it's spend. I mean, the, the, the nonsensical bit about it is that they're talking about the uh, the breakfast meal as the one that you create these burritos and you save a bunch of cash. Eat oats. It's 70 cents a dish, not even 50 cents. I love oats. I'm the they're biggest great. fan of oats. Yeah, they're great. Like oats with banana, oats with chocolate, oats with peanut butter. Oh, now you're going oh. too far. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's probably too expensive. Yeah, oh, yeah it's no. way too expensive. For yeah, me. now it's become. Lucky we don't put oats with avocado. Yeah. We never <laughs> yeah, have that. <laughs> and so the that... I mean, how do you, how are these people retiring early? They're saving 80 They're saving like 80, 90% of their income um, and putting it into an investment. And the idea is to get that investment to a point where the investment returns are enough for them to quit their jobs. Um, and that's just how investment works, right? Mm. Like the idea of investment in general is to save something right now to have a better something later. And they are just really accelerating that process. They mm. are putting themselves in positions where they can have that investment portfolio. Mm. How many people are expecting to be extremely rich in the future so they're doing nothing right now? (laughs) Oh, so many, so many. And you know what? I've even been a little bit guilty of just Uh going like, oh, I'll prioritise that later when I have more funds. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, that's a really bad strategy. Do as I say, not as I do, right? So do you think like where does that fit? So for instance, with uh, with how we run our business, we pay ourselves small salaries with the idea that we are building this thing. Yeah which isn't necessarily conducive to the personal saving thing, but you've got this sort of weird yeah, investment I think it's, thing Yeah, but I think it's different in business. Mm. Like business is like if you look at assets that return, business is the asset that returns the most. 
Um, and like in Australia, that's where most of the money is actually made. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting and I think it's a good strategy. Make sure it's good business. Obviously, mm -hmm. I write these, so I'll just mm -hmm. hang out with you guys. <laughs> no. Yeah, we supply wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Like that, cheap, you had to lure me and you literally yeah, had to bribe cheap. me. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, so I think that that's a strategy and it's a wealth creation strategy and you're investing in your business. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you're not investing. You're actually putting funds into your business to grow that because you're expecting capital growth. Mm -hmm. And if you're not expecting capital growth, like not sure why you're funding yeah, funding yeah. it. Mm. But, but I think, wine. <laughs> yeah, like I'm here for it. I think it's a great business model. Yeah. Wine, chips, I'm, I'm done. It would have been good if there was cheese as well. Yeah, look. But that's, that's fine. I can't eat cheese, and but I feel like you've met this, like my really random dietary requirements. You've oh, really? met literally oh, by perfect. accident. Oh, great. You're welcome. What, what are you, uh, I'm glad we didn't get cheese. You're lactose intolerant? Yeah, yeah. like, all right, are you ready? Oh, these are all this your intolerances. Is, this is literally oh, you're list. Intolerance list. Yeah, all right. Yeah. If you're a milk lab, <laughs> this is gal, disgusting. Honestly, I never say gal. It's the wine. <laughs> honestly, I I <laughs> hate <laughs> myself. Like I, I so actually I apologize. <laughs> Excuse me. No, I hate me. As oh, it, okay. I hate, all right. I yeah. um, no, I, I actually apologize to waitresses often. I'm just I'm so sorry I exist. Like, so I'm yeah. gluten, dairy, soy, corn intolerant, and I'm also a vegetarian. So I animal don't really, soy vegetarian. Yeah. Animal soy vegetarian. And like, what do they replace most Mate, animal get, products what, with? Oh, soy and corn. Can't eat that. Vegetarian. Oh, so I can eat potato chips and I can drink wine. So oh, we perfect. are good. I almost bought honey soy chips. <laughs> so with that if, oh, because soy. Honey yeah. and soy. Yeah. Yeah. Honey soy chicken. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Not a good that would have been beautiful. <laughs> yeah, sorry so what is that. your, um, <laughs> because I was actually uh, yesterday, uh, my girlfriend <laughs> Brie was organising um she was going to the groceries, uh, to the supermarket. supermarket. Yeah. And she... Uh, the groceries are which groceries. <laughs> Yeah. Well, she didn't actually. So um, she called me and said, hey, is there anything you want? And she said, I'm getting dark chocolate. I said, can you get some Coke Zero, please? Yeah. And we had that call and then we were driving 97 home. And then as we were driving home, Bree's like, what should we have for dinner? And Coke 97... Well, yeah, 97 thought Obviously. that was very funny because Bree had gone to the supermarket and we ended up with... Coke, Coke Zero. Zero and chocolate. That's a and that's very balanced was, diet. That's what I was planning on having, but Bree's like, no, I actually want something. Well, maybe she should have thought about that when she was yeah. at the supermarket. I know, but this, is what he, this is what he was saying. But the point is, it's like, like what are you, are you someone who actually, especially have been so intolerant to so many things? I, I'm very considerate. I plan a lot of my food. So um, what are you eating? What's your, what's your diet look like? I eat a lot of Asian food. Because oh, yeah. it's very easy as long as it's not soy based. It's mm -hmm. pretty good. Lots of green curries, lots of red curries, vegetables, no tofu. They're quite easy um, to. Would you like some more? I would love yeah, some okay, more. Yeah, okay. Um, the. That sounds good. Like yeah, that's it's, it's, it's like pretty good. I eat a lot of. I do eat eggs. Yeah. Um. So that's pretty good. I eat a lot of eggs mm -hmm. literally every day. Eat every the morning. yolk. I do. Of Nothing course. wrong with the yolk. No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I'm not one of these people that just has egg white scramble. Yeah. Are you I feel like Sebs would. No, 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 no. You have the whole thing. Are you sure? Yeah, why would you have? <laughs> no, I just feel like you'd do be the because there's yeah, a lot of people. Harper, Craig Harper would get rid of the yolk. Uh, back in the day, I don't think now. Really, have they've it. got rid of the. So the whole thing was that cholesterol. You, yeah, too much cholesterol. No, so it's all fine now. That. I it's put all good, salt huh? on everything. It's really, like, is like that... I'm the biggest salt fan you've ever met. It's actually borderline obsessive. What do you put it on? Everything. Peanut butter. All right. Toast. You guys name me a food that doesn't go with salt. Um, yeah, because peanut butter does. Chocolate uh, goes well with salt, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. Uh, do you too. put it on yeah. chocolate? Like, I, I love a good salted chocolate. Yeah. I love a good salted caramel. Ice cream, but then you get salted yeah. caramel. Damn it. Like, please. There's not much. There's actually nothing. Tomato what do you mean there's not much? No, you have not named one yeah, thing. No, you're right. There's zero. <laughs> yeah, so salt goes with everything. I just don't understand why it you does. put it on. Bread? Like, yeah. Salt. I guess put a bit of oil and salt. would be nice. Oh, that would be lovely. Much better. Wine. <laughs> Honestly, all right. I'm gonna take like. If there's something, with salt, like, it sounds like you've done. I feel a like banana. I try to be refined, banana. but I'm salt, potassium. It's great. I mean, you wouldn't put, put it, it on together. yogurt. Salt and yogurt. Is that a good point. Yeah, and but you would if you were having yogurt on a curry. If you're having a tzatziki, you would. Yeah, you would have tzatziki. Oh uh, yeah. Oh yeah. You do weird shit with yogurt, Mister Ninety Seven. What do you mean? Don't accuse him of that. Oh, I'm accusing just, you, him of it. Well, people put it. You put yogurt, plain yogurt, into a bunch of savoury dishes. That I'm skeptical of. That's because it does go with everything. Yeah, I, what, yogurt? Like, I'm what? intolerant, but I'm here for it. Yeah, yogurt does not go on bread. I actually, fuck. But do you know what? You mentioned <laughs> salt and wine before. If you get a really ridiculously cheap bottle of wine, mm -hmm. and I know this from being a very poor uni student. What would be a cheap wine? Uh, Audi $4? There's like four. Really? Yeah, you, can, you can get bottles of wine for $3, $4. If you put a 
a pinch of salt in there, it changes the tannins, it changes it. Also, you can aerate it with a blender. So if you want mm. to be really fancy and uh, an absolute bogan, and I'm really actually <laughs> upset with myself that I'm admitting no, this, this, put a pinch of salt in a bottle of wine, chuck it all in the blender, blend it, and it tastes a million times better. Blend it. This is blend right. I'm pretty sure really we're an 18 year old similar. <laughs> blend it. It aerates it. I've seen a great. So. <laughs> it aerates it. It does. You need to aerate the wine. Why do you think people decant <laughs> oh, wine? Yeah, but mm. not in blenders. No, so that's quicker. me taking it to it's the next quicker. level. <laughs> well, there's a one where you um, you put it above the wine glass, and as you put it in, it goes. It's yeah, it's like got yeah. one of those. It's, it's, a, it's, a air, it's, it's an aerator. Adding, yeah, it's adding yeah, air. It's a legitimate aerator. You got aerator. one of them. Yeah, absolutely. Are you a, would you count yourself as a minimalist? No. Got a lot of things? No, not necessarily. I actually feel like I'm one of those people who actually wants to buy quality over quantity. That is such a thing at the moment. Yeah, I'm doing but the I've same always thing. been like that. Mm-hmm. I've always been like that because my mum has taught me to be like that. Mm-hmm. She said, "Buy it once, buy it right." Yeah, that's a great like idea. That. Is it a, what's a, your best apartment purchase? living, or what's what sort of your what's your living arrangement? I live in a townhouse. Okay. What's, so, your, what's your best purchase that is under your mum's ethos? Ah. Oh. A lot of stuff, to be honest. I've got a pair of boots, actually. This is going really weird. No, this weird is, way, this but is how I've got a pair goes. of boots uh-huh. um, that I bought when I was 14 and I still wear them every wow. single winter. I Pro- love them. I reckon my foot's grown too much since I was 14. Oh, no, I'm you still small. Growing? Like, no, <laughs> I'm tiny. I'm 5'2". Five two. Five You're 5'2". Five two. Two. I'm wearing heels. I walked in in heels. My mum's 5'2", I think. Yeah. Not Do you have to wear me. heels all the time? I don't have to. But you choose to? When I wear flats in the office, everyone mm-hmm. comments on how small they are. Really? Yeah. It's not great. What do you think? Um, you just remind it, them that you're the boss at that point. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, like I feel like any good business... Your employees, you work for them. You make every, you make no, their life better. Here. <laughs> not here. No, absolutely not. No, you work for them no, no. because if you make their life easier, they make your business better. So no, yeah, no, no they absolutely. Not. How do you find good people uh, when you're running your business? Uh, that is actually probably the hardest. Yeah, thing let us know when you find out because <laughs> we've got some dead wood. In, and I'm not talking about this stuff. Right no, no, no. That's well and truly dead. <laughs> Why is your wood laughing? <laughs> <laughs> so weird. The, um, it's going red. It's yeah. changing colours. Oh my the, god! The, Maybe that's collectors. <laughs> <laughs> Sell it. <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, how Marie have, Conduit. <laughs> get rid of it. <laughs> how have you found uh, good people in your business to surround yourself with? Um, it's really, really hard. It's uh, it's honestly the hardest thing that I deal with, and at the moment, I'm actually trying to find a couple of people to join the team, and I just haven't found the mm. right fit yet because it's like a mixture of skill and ability. And I'm very happy, um, like in my business, I'm very happy to compromise on skill because I Mm. believe that that's trainable, um, but being a good person isn't. Um, And I feel like that's something that is really hard to manage. And a few of my staff members and my team members and, you know, business partners have actually come through just like long-term friendships Mm. and long-term relationships. And a lot of people say, don't work with your friends. Um, But I believe with a pretty good shareholders agreement, it's Mm. not a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, Like... I have Morgan who is in my business and she runs the um, debt side of my business and she's one of the best people I've ever met. And when we went into business, a lot of people just said, look, that's a really bad idea. You guys are too close. And I I have Mm. not regretted that decision Mm. and I don't think I ever will. She's one of the best things that's happened to my business. Was that a consistent thing or was one person that really cut deep that said that? Because uh, I think it's like, you know, you know, your dad, your dad cares about you. Like my dad's yeah, like, yeah. oh, are you really sure this is a good mm, idea? Yeah. And I'm like, yes, dad, sorry, dad. Has your dad had a failed partnership? No, no, not that I'm aware of. Well, well, I, think that, I think that's <laughs> well, the, like the, the whole money the, story. The fastest sinking ship is a partnership. I yeah. think that's what. Yeah, yeah. Did your dad say that? I don't yeah. know. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, my dad says some pretty wise things, but yeah. that's not one no, of them. No, he didn't say that. No. Um, but you see why, like, I, I understand the challenges of a partnership. Yeah, uh, hurtful. <laughs> oh, listen, do you want me to leave? Like, do you have some stuff you, actually, you need to sort out? Um, <laughs> what's it, the moderator? What's the thing called? You've done a psychology degree. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I actually have a minor in family mediation, so are we oh, ready? Oh, this is good. <laughs> uh, the um, job interviews are dumb. Can job interviews agree? are the, dumb. Because it's like I've, I, um, when I was working at a, another place, we did a, f- a bunch of job interviews and – the first time we ever hired someone based on a job interview that I was involved in, we did a terrible job. Why? And because a person that we were interviewing, they said all the things that we wanted them to yeah. say every, and any time that we, we asked the right questions, 
but then you just take it on face value. So it's like yeah. ca- we we can't see in your portfolio that you do this type of work. And they'll jump in and say, oh, no, I can, I can do that. And it's like, oh, f- good. Oh, great. I'm I was so worried glad about that. Yeah, that. yeah. I, was, I was worried about that. So I was going to. And then you hire them and you realize it's like, oh, no, they just fucking said what you wanted them mm. to say. Yeah. Um, I, I think I'm very lucky in that my background in psych was actually in culture and engagement and creating mm-hmm. teams. Um, so I feel like I've carried a lot of that into the way I've created Zella and our recruitment process is arduous. Like I apologise to everyone who's been through it, but it's, you know, there's three interviews. There is psychometric assessment. There is a physical assessment that you need to do. What's to prove a physical assessment look like? Um, not Kettlebell like swings? <laughs> At least four. <laughs> okay. yeah. Um, Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we screwed. Russian Rhymes or break. American stuff. Yeah, no, a lot of like Russian twists as well. Okay, yeah, like yeah, how sure. many can you do? How long can you plank? Uh-huh. Um, no, none of that. Um, what is it? What does it actually look it's like? It's actually like a piece of financial advice in a, a situation. Like, what would you do? How would you do this? Like, what's the type of advice you'd give so I can get an understanding of not just their um, capability, but actually mm. how they think and like, where's your strategy at? What does that actually look like? Because financial advice is so many pieces that come together and I need to know how they think because if they are just really pragmatic and do what they were told to do and they're not taking the big picture into consideration, well, that's not really going to work for the type of business I'm trying to grow. So for me, recruitment is arduous and very um, tedious and Mm -hmm. it does take like six weeks to get through. But to me, it's meant that we haven't had an issue with hiring the wrong type of staff and like we haven't had any turnover of the people that we have had join the team. What about uh, clients that come to you and they say, I'm struggling with getting a pay rise? How do you? How do oh, you... I love that. Next week's podcast episode, oh, like great. my podcast oh, is perfect. actually on pay rises. Uh, so this is an exclusive. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. <laughs> Unless absolutely. you're not I going just... to talk about it. <laughs> no, because, no, no, no. I haven't, I haven't thought of a witty title yet though. Okay. So if you guys want to brainstorm that. Yeah. Give really me good. more money. Show yeah. me the money. Show me the money. Oh, that's show, pretty good. Oh, show me the money's good. Show I didn't me say, the money. You said that's that. pretty good. I didn't say yeah. that. I always try to make all of my like podcast titles like I'm not funny. So this takes me a really long time. Uh-huh. But like Either song on. names that oh, I've yeah. changed. So like recently it was like I ain't saying she's a gold digger. Oh, that's gold, good. So if they're session, all like, um, they're all music like song titles they're not all song titles because mm-hmm. i'm actually not that witty mm-hmm. um but you know i do put a lot of effort into looking like that on the internet what What do you think the number one you're on spotify yeah you're on yep. spotify you can see what artists people listen to that listen to your podcast can you yeah, do that yeah jasmine thompson Jasmine Thompson. And what, what sort of music does she do? She does like acoustic covers <laughs> really? of things and like she's really aligned to our brand. I'm uh, not sad because I do listen to yeah. her. But I'm more I of a Voice also... Avenue kind of guy. Yeah, I'm not cool. I'm uh, really, really not cool. <laughs> no, no, I don't Ask think my I'm... little sister. I'm so not cool. It's not funny. And so, no, because that could be an interesting tactic. You could go through all the artists, see what songs they are, they, they sing, annoying, like, annoying that it's um, mm. covers. But you could work out, like I'm thinking like Party in the U.S., like say uh, Miley. Miley Cyrus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are all the Miley Cyrus bangers? And then we could do a play based could on that. Do, I could do that season by season. It could oh. be the Miley season. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. What about like an Here Elton John one? What's, what's oh, Elton yes. John do? Tiny Dancer. Tiny Dancer. Tiny Pay Rise. <laughs> <laughs> it gets lost. He's all right, his. all right. I don't feel like that <laughs> yeah. works. But yes, um, where uh, were we? Can, pay Rise. Candle in the Pay, pay Rise. rise. Yeah. Uh, so what is... What is the, what's a way to get a pay rise? Just ask for it. Just ask for it? No, that's terrible advice. <laughs> that is one piece um, of advice. I so think I is- actually think this is a really interesting topic and it's something that I am quite passionate about because people are so good at calling millennials entitled. Mm-hmm. And I think that there is two things, right? There are the millennials who are actually putting the hard work in and actually getting it done and actually deserve the pay rise. And there are actually some millennials that I meet that are saying things like, look, I deserve it because I've worked there for a year. And I don't personally believe that you are deserving of a pay rise just because of tenure. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more about proving your value and getting people to understand, you know, where you're coming from and showing your employer that, you know, you are valuable and putting a case together to say, look, I would like a pay rise based on this. It's not about just saying, I want more money. What about like, because I've always felt that the main way that I've ever gotten a pay rise is by changing companies. Uh, so it's one of those things where it's like once you're baked in, 
there's only been but one But if you had those conversations, like if you gone to your manager and mm-hmm. said, look, I believe yeah. that my value is far more than the remuneration I'm receiving, have you asked that or have you just gone, all right, I think that I need to get a new job to move to the next yeah, level? Yeah, no, so I've, I've definitely said, hey, based on the things that I'm doing, yeah. I think that this is worth more to the business. I think that it's like it's going up a skill yeah. set. Interestingly... I mean, for a lot of people, I think the common thing is pay freezes. A lot of businesses love doing that. It's like, oh, no, we're in a pay freeze and talk to like. um, Oh, sorry, you've reached the top of your band. Yeah, just these types of conversations. And the interesting thing was where I saw the biggest increase ever was when I changed titles. And the funny thing was the managers at the time had said, Josh, titles, don't worry about titles. I changed my title. And then they came back like a week later being like, oh, you're actually, we've just had a look at like the ste- the average or whatever, the f- like that band thing. And it's in a different mm. thing. And I all of a sudden got a 15, 20% increase. Hey, that's pretty just good. Just based on that change. When they were saying at the time that those things don't don't matter. Yeah, so those, okay. those stone, that stonewalling from middle managers is an interesting one because I was even speaking to a middle manager who was saying, oh, I was pushing back on this person and then I had this realisation. It's like, why the fuck do I care? Why don't I just mm. push it forward to my manager? Yeah. but yeah. then it's, I, uh, it's interesting, right? Well, the stonewalling, we got to understand if it's the person saying, can I get a pay rise mm-hmm. with no outlining or having some entrepreneurial spirit to say, here's where we are, here's where I've taken you or this position. Or if they're or- underperforming. That seems like a common one too, which is like the person that's underperforming that then goes forward and says, oh, I want also want more money. And mm. I think that potentially plays into that millennial thing, yeah. which there is a s- small portion of the population that probably does yeah. fit into that where it's like their first job, they probably listen to a podcast and get the, mm. the get energy, the get the motivation the energy, to go yeah, up and yeah. do it. It's like, Mate, you're lucky that you went past your six month program. I, I, I think I'm less empathetic towards millennials after having my own business and my <laughs> mates having their I've business. Got no time like for the it. shit I have heard from. Excuse me, millennial, <laughs> pipe down. No, but the, the shit right, I have the shit I have heard about. <laughs> okay, boomer. Staff <laughs> leaving early, like staff not telling people they've quit. Mm. What? Like seriously? What like, are you talking about? Yeah. So it's a real problem. Yeah. If you if you don't if you are working within a company, you're in a contract and you just bail. Young people don't tell, like, they the don't company. Want to that they don't want, they to, don't want to say they're quitting. Yeah. They don't pick up the phone. Young mate doesn't like oh, to get actually, on the phone. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, what happens? You're I, I in a know. contract with them. I literally don't know. Thankfully, that's never happened to me. It's because of the six-week boot camp you put your people through. Yeah, look, I'm here <laughs> the for physical. it. Yeah. I'm but, sorry, but has that failed me? <laughs> no, 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 it's a good <laughs> thing. No, it's exactly. A good thing. It's a good thing, but I think it is hard to fire people these days. And so... I get the sort of narrative around millennials are a shit, lazy, whatever. But it's like that's too triggering to say yeah. when maybe there's a bunch of people who are not wanting to make phone calls, mm-hmm. not wanting to lean forward, lean into a hard conversation, asking for money or saying yeah. I don't like it here, and then they're just disconnecting. And so this is where some of it's true. Is all millennials lazy? No, absolutely all millennials not. are absolutely not lazy. Absolutely not. But it's... It's a thing. Like it, it I had is a, a friend That's what recently I'm trying to say, yeah. who hired a new receptionist and on day three she just didn't come back from lunch. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Is, a good is lunch? she okay? I, don't, I lunch. don't know, but she's like, she didn't come back and we called her and she said she wasn't coming back, so she's alive. Yeah. But, uh, it's God. full on, isn't back. it? But I, it all comes down to um, having difficult conversations. And mm. so, mate, like mm. where did you land with thinking when it comes to this latest episode basically give us the give us the exclusive what do people need to do what's the steps i think to it's, get about a pay rise? Under, it's understanding your value mm-hmm. and you know what when you said before that you had gone to your manager and said i want to pay rise mm-hmm. sometimes the best thing for you is to actually leave yeah and that's a hard decision to make mm-hmm. but i believe that you really should give your employer at the time the best opportunity and every possible opportunity to remunerate you in the way that you feel like you are deserving And if that's not possible, well, of course I'm going to leave. But I think that it's really important to also realise that your value needs to be understood from both sides. Maybe they just needed you to do the job that they'd employed you to do and Mm -hmm. this above and beyond and this discretionary effort that you're putting in. They're like, yeah, it's bloody brilliant, but it's not what we are remunerating you for. 
Um, so it's about knowing your value, knowing where you sit and how that works. And there's so many resources online. Like the Hayes Salary Guide is something that I really like. Because the Hayes it, Salary Guide? What is yeah. Hayes? Don't it's, look it it's up, a, Mason. No, 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 it's like, it's just a recruitment <laughs> company. Saying, oh, it's blocked. Um, it's a recruitment company <laughs> that um, I've had a previous relationship with. I don't use them at the moment, but they are pretty good. Um, and they put this guide out every year mm. of what the average salaries are for each level. And like, it'll be like accountant and it'll be like one year, two year, three year experience and tell um, employers what the average employee is being mm. paid in different areas. So it'll be like, you know, Vic Metro, Vic, Vic Regional. So mm -hmm. you can see what the different salaries are. And I think that having a really good understanding of what your role is currently being paid as well gives you a good indicator of whether you're being underpaid or overpaid or if you're just on par. Mm. Is there a way of communicating it? Do you think is it is it a bit cheeky to rock up? No, I'm, the, I'm here for yeah, it. As yeah, much as I think it it's out. a bit cheeky, yeah. I think it's more knowing your value. Mm -hmm. Proved your employee, you did your research. Yeah. There is a... Um, I'm probably a, going to be hated by so many employers in no, Australia. I think, so yeah, sorry. I think what you're but, saying is, is it is it cheeky? It's like even it giving it yeah, that... Yeah. Li label of I mean, you don't cheeky have to is throw like it. inferring that it's going to be a hard conversation. Well, I guess like sort of ruffling feathers. I mean, point I probably around... wouldn't go in and be like, "Here's my research thesis mm -hmm. on why I should yeah, get paid." Yeah. But even more. looking at the health of a business, right? If you're in a if you're in a small business and you see that they're like trying, they're struggling to yeah. make profits or they're struggling with revenue, probably like yeah, mm -hmm. like thinking about does the the person who especially roles that don't have revenue connected to them yeah i find interesting where it's like if you got a sales role it becomes a little bit easier where it's like yeah. if you can generate x amount of money yeah, for yeah. the business it's it's an easy sell <coughs> the um freelancing thing the side hustle stuff the gig economy people are obviously taking their initiative they're going on to word or they're using myob and they're getting setting up a account and they're sending an invoice how many of them are actually considering things like tax obligations so many of them are forgetting yeah but I, I think it's really important that if you're going to start a business start it on the right foot work out what your tax obligations are work out how quickly you're going to get generate profit are you going to generate profit above seventy five thousand dollars okay well you need to pay gst what does that look like how do you invoice for that um i think above that 35 grand <coughs> 75. Oh, sorry, I, I 75. Is it not 85 now or is it, is it lowered to 75? I'm, I'm absolutely not. I had 35 counted. and I thought, poor little freelancers. <laughs> yeah, no, 35 no, no. would be hard. <laughs> no, but GST is like, yeah. it's it's you charging your client mm -hmm. so then you can pay it. It's like, yeah. it's a no sum, no yeah. win game. Yeah. It's kind of like you charge it over there and then they should be claiming it and then you pay it. And yeah. It's just one of those things that's no well, sum. Well, I think to be honest, at the, in the early days, you d I, I, I was explained that, mm -hmm. but I didn't fathom it until I was in it. And yeah. I'm not charging GST. And then I'm like, I'll take the leap and charge it. I don't even know if I can make 75 grand. I make 100 grand yeah. that year. I'm like, well, fucking sweet. Yeah. I feel like you need, in some ways, I felt that, especially day one, I'm like, okay, if I can charge <laughs> through an, in, if I'm invoicing a client and it makes up 20% of that 75 grand to be, I think it's non -G smart. having non GST on there is setting no. a real clear signal that you like you're they're a baby. A big, yeah, and you're they're a, a big part of the business. Yeah. So I'm just like, fuck it. Like I'd much prefer to just get the GST going. I talk to my yeah. clients about this all the time, mm -hmm. and I think that if you are a business and you are sending out invoices mm -hmm. and you want to look legit, yeah, GST, yeah, because it means that your business is generating more than seventy five thousand dollars in mm -hmm. revenue. So you can pay GST voluntarily, like you can charge it and pay it. You don't have to be earning over it. There's just an obligation to pay it when you're earning over seventy five thousand um, dollars. So I think that you know, if you mm -hmm. want to make your business look more legitimate, paying mm -hmm. GST is a very good way of sending a signal, especially if you're B two B. Like mm -hmm. if you, other businesses are paying you and engaging you for services, it just makes you seem like you know, you've been doing this for a while. And if it goes to the accounts team and they're putting it through, like I, I know that it's a thing that we, a thi not even mm. judging people on, but you do think about it. It's like, okay, this is a smaller freelancer who's not charging GST. Yeah, it, it's the mindset, mm. right? And like I've done yeah. this as well. I see it in my business when I outsource things and get things done. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, well, they're at the start of their journey. Yeah. Um, and that's not a bad thing. I'm all for it. I mm -hmm. love small business. But I know a lot of people don't see it that way. They yeah. go, oh, maybe there's a little bit more risk there because yeah. they don't have the experience. Uh, what's What's been the um, the branding but the sort of 
the view on financial advisors, particularly after Barefoot's book. Oh, they're terrible. Came out. Don't talk to a financial well, advisor. You read, Honestly, you read, what are you uh, doing? Uh, they're terrible. Our mate, our Gronk mate, Scott Pape. <clears throat> his book, there's some questions that he wants you to call and ask your financial advisor. Yeah, ask away. Did a good financial get... advisor should – I've I've been sent that so many times. I'm so sick of it. Scott Pape's uh, three Scotty questions. Pape. Do you have canned responses? Okay, we've got the book no. there. I, I wouldn't mind it. Can you grab it, Mason, just what, you what got, the questions are? What have you got the barefoot investor for? He's a client of ours. Yeah, yeah. great. We charge him GST. Yeah, awesome, <laughs> awesome. He, yeah, he pays it. Awesome. Uh, and then we pass it on to the tax department. All right. No, but well, he, is it literally? Scott, is under, it's literally under. Oh, we IMAC. use it as a um, <laughs> the screen. Scott, you don't we're have using to your book it. as a screen elevator. It's Scott, a, shout out! Yeah. My book comes out in October. Watch out! Yeah, yeah. Oh, what that's is your the family's one. It's not in there. Anyway, so no, you've been asked legitimate. these. You've been asked <laughs> these questions. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that any good financial advisor can answer them clearly. And and so, is there a problem with not within your circle? Obviously. You're squeaky clean. Oh, yeah. So you know, no, I'm, I'm that, really lucky. Like yeah. I am so, so lucky to be working in the space at the time that I'm working in. Mm. I didn't. I have not entered the industry where commission is the standard. I have yeah. entered the industry where I am a fee-for-service financial advisor because, one, that made sense to me, and, two, you could see the industry going there. I have a lot of sympathy for a lot of financial advisors who are in positions where they – have books of commission that they need to change because, you know, after the Royal Commission, a lot has changed. Um, and I've been really lucky that that hasn't impacted me. But the reason that hasn't impacted me is, one, my business model is is good, but it's mm. good because it's new. I haven't mm. been in this industry for 30 years. I haven't got this revenue and this tenure that, you know, mm -hmm. extends past there. So as much as I'm saying, look, I'm good, it's like, well, I'm also really friggin' lucky because mm. I got into this industry at a time where it was like, all right, well, they're moving away from commission-based. I probably shouldn't do that. And so so if you just elaborate on that, so old school financial planners, would advisors. Would take a commission would... based on the performance of someone's uh, investments. Okay. And I don't do that. And so what is the other model? You submit FIFA? You FIFA service. So you come oh, to me. Sorry, FIFA. FIFA service. I heard FIFA the soccer. No, no, no. FIFA 2019 or 2020? No, no, no. I don't know if 2020 has <laughs> come out yet. Come on no, now. No, I'm sure FIFA. <laughs> Are you not, joking? Remember that FIFA would do the, I've got a soccer mad partner oh, really? and I'm like, FIFA? I, I got like some brownie points early really? in our relationship by buying that game for him. I feel like <laughs> FIFA <laughs> normally like... All these games, they do it a year before. Yeah. So I feel like we'd see FIFA 20, like 21. I don't know if it's out. He's a bit busy. So like FIFA no, is not cool. the priority anymore. EB Games, yeah. is that where you go? Or? It was where I went. What do you mean? Well, Why? I haven't bought him FIFA this okay, year. Yeah, sure. busy. I get it. He doesn't, um, he doesn't so, play anymore. I'm not going to buy a game he's not going to use. Come on now. And no, there is something nice about relaxing. There's and, something nice about And so do you think the financial advisory Businesses will lean towards the fee for service yeah, most as a standard, and so yeah. it will remove the the commission based shit. Yeah. So then it will clean up the industries. That it's absolutely going to clean up the industry. What about like yeah. prior, like so doing sort of creating your own products? Yeah. How how does that play into? Because obviously the problem with commission is it's skewing people to or, or um, advisors to advise on certain things that they know. Like, okay, we get X yep. commission for this, X commission for that. Obviously, uh, if you have your own product and you're like, hey, use our product, there is the thing in the back of your everyone's mind, which well, is like- is that the right product for yeah. that client too? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, I don't have my own products. One, because I'm not big enough yet, mm -hmm. but two, because it's one of those things where it's like, well, even if I had my own product or my own model portfolio, you could say, is that the right option for a particular client? Because not all products fit everyone. It's not, you know, cookie cutter kind mm -hmm. of service. Um, and I think that it's really interesting because, you know, if you work as a financial advisor for a bank, you only have access to their products. So is that truly holistic advice? I don't know. It's biased. Yeah, yeah it's a bit point, biased yeah. because it's like, well, if you work for a big bank and then you only have access to their products and their really limited APL, which is an approved product list, um, are you actually biased or mm -hmm. not biased? Like it, it, it's yeah, sure. interesting. And I am I'm an independent advisor that actually has – I, I have an APL and with a mm. licensee at the moment and they give me access to everything. But if I find a product that works better for my client, they'll always consider it. Mm -hmm. um, and none of my financial advisors and I don't get remunerated for the product I buy or the product I buy for my client. So it doesn't matter whether they go with one bank or another bank or, you know, a different investment product. My advisors still get paid exactly the same 
every, every single month, regardless of how mm. many clients they've seen. What about the f- <clears throat> super free thinkers who are like, ah, fuck all the systems, like uh, even uh, what you're doing. They don't want to go to anyone. They want to manage it all themselves. They say, okay, like I'm going to um, uh, buy like stock in like the top 100 or what- whatever it is, like index funds, all that sort of shit. I'm just you saying words you, now. You do you, boo-boo. Yeah, but what is the like wh- what's the um, contrary sort of – opinion on that where can that go wrong well, it depends are you buying an index fund why are you buying an index fund an index mm-hmm. fund is legitimately the average of the average is that why you're investing mm-hmm. it's not why yeah, i'm sure. investing so go for it if that's up for you yeah and so then the other options are the i guess so it depends the psycholo- how much money you yeah. have mm-hmm. so like if you are starting and you're like look i've got 500 bucks to invest i'm mm-hmm. like cool your options are really really limited if you then come to me and say i have 500 000 to invest it's like all right well you're probably going to go direct equities because you're able to create a well diversified portfolio and with investing diversity is key and making sure that your portfolio isn't all your eggs in one basket and making sure that you actually have that diversity across that portfolio and if you only have a small amount of money and you know what was it like ANZ shares or something yesterday were like $85 mm-hmm. it's like well if you've only got $500 you can't really get a well diversified yeah. portfolio by buying direct shares can you and so what about the cuz i guess there's that idea of buying a house or renting and then using the extra cash you have to invest. If you're in a position like that, where does someone start? Oh, it is so, so personal and that mm-hmm. sucks because I wish I could be like, this is how it goes, do this, mm-hmm. it's the model. Mm-hmm. Um, it it completely depends. Like if you want to purchase a home, it's all emotionally driven. Like at the moment I don't own property and that's a conscious choice. Like I don't want to own property because it doesn't align to my values and I don't want to own property because I'm not ready to take on the responsibility of that. I really like renting. I like the fact that, you know, somebody else worries about my broken hot water system. Mm -hmm. I love that that's not an unexpected cost. I love that the asset that I'm creating, which is in shares, pays me a dividend and I don't have to go fix somebody else's leaky taps. Um, But at some point, you know, based on relationship my partner is going to want to buy property he wants to own his own home and it's working out what that looks like because every investment decision is actually an emotionally driven investment decision Mm -hmm. it's not actually something you go all right well I'm going to get the best bang for my buck over here because I'm telling you right now it's not property and so the reason that is the reason why I get like it because everything is emotional and so say for instance when when should someone prioritize the dream versus what's actually going to be better for them? And I guess like the reason I'm thinking about this is there's people who it's like they'll have the mortgage, they'll <laughs> they'll um they'll buy a house, yeah, but then somehow they'll also go on like the round the world trip and they'll do yeah. all of that other other stuff. You need to look at the big picture. Yeah. Like what are we trying to create here? Like mm-hmm. my ultimate goal and the thing that I'm so passionate about is creating financial freedom. And to me that is having an income that comes in each and every single month that I do not have to work for. Um, and that's why I, why I invest and that's why I want all of my clients to invest. And it's like, well, can you create that while doing all of that? So, so what does it more- mean to invest what, do you, what is what kind of what, cash we're talking? About? Yeah, but you also, give me but all also, your money and then I disappear. <laughs> no, and so that's a good investment for you. <laughs> like it's um, great. <laughs> and so the criteria of investment is, is, I guess that most people think about it's like okay, so an investment is you something, own stock or you own like what are the different versions? But there, of stock, there are uh, there are four investment. different asset classes, mm-hmm. and the idea of an asset or the idea of an investment is to put your money somewhere where you get a return. Mm -hmm. Like, and my favorite type of asset is an asset that returns not only dividends and gives you money in return, but also increases in value. So when I sell it, it's worth more. So Mm -hmm. that's to me shares at this Mm -hmm. point in time, but the main asset classes in Australia, everyone knows property. Like that's pretty big. You could be a rent vester. You could be just a investment property mogul. You could also own property directly as your family home. You've got shares in the share market, then you've got bonds and then you've got cash. And so cash in your, um, Bank account is an investment in itself because it should be earning a really low amount of interest, but it isn't, it's an investment in your future. Mm -hmm. Um, So those are the four main asset classes in Australia, but it totally depends on your risk profile and your um, tenacity to invest as to what asset class works for you. Because obviously um, cash is far more conservative than the share market, Mm -hmm. but then the share market has its own diverse 
ranges of risk and like some shares are more risky than others. Like if you buy a bank, obviously that's been around for forever and a day and the returns on a bank are quite low in comparison to, you know, something like Afterpay, which I don't invest in, mm. but that's Silly also move. a lot. Yeah, but it's also a lot more risky. <laughs> no, my brother invests in that. Oh, well, check him out. Did he make a lot of money? Well, he invested when it was like $4 a share. Okay, well, he's What is it now? <laughs> like 35 Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. At least 35 but the that's moral, the, the moral right. ethics of afterpay. But I don't if he got it. in early, no, I neither do I. I've got an entire podcast episode on mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And when you're saying <laughs> investment no, in afterpay, yeah. you don't mean just buying shit online using afterpay. <laughs> <Does> it, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. we should swing it that way. <laughs> yeah. um, no, it's buying shares yeah. in a company. But if someone is talking about this asset and there's a whole heap of hype around it, mm. you can almost guarantee that that has already peaked. Like mm. if someone has started talking about Afterpay as an asset and like let's use Bitcoin mm-hmm. as an example here. Like the – I don't believe in investing in Bitcoin because there's absolutely no research basis or, or financial basis to it. But I believe quite passionately that if you're investing and everyone's already talking about it, it's a bit too late. Mm-hmm. And so in regards to investing, say if you had an extra two grand a month to invest somewhere. Two grand a month? You are a baller. Do you no, know no. that if you were 21 – Mm-hmm. And you invested. I'm nearly thirty. Right. Well, we got no. Mister ninety seven is 20. twenty one this year. So if yeah. we go. All right, Mister ninety seven, okay, are you great. ready for this? Because we, go. Yeah, Cause we go. can make you financially. If you have five hundred dollars to invest each mm-hmm. and every single month until you retire, that is two hundred forty thousand dollars that you've saved. Mm-hmm. But if you put it into an investment that, on average, returns between five and seven and a half percent, you've got a one point two million dollar investment portfolio. And so, so and that sounds cool, like oh, one point two million dollars. That's sick. But why is that sick? Because it returns you sixty thousand dollars a year in reverse investment dividends, and that's the money that you then live off. And so so the that's asset what I'm grown, curious. But, so the asset itself has grown, and it pays the dividend yeah. of the sixty. So it's yeah. the one so, you like. So, so it's, based it's on the one I like because it actually yeah. creates an income for you. Mm-hmm. So the idea is to create an asset that you don't have to sell and you don't have to extinguish because if you extinguish it then it's gone. Mm. Like it's to create an asset that lives forever that you then just take the profit off the top and keep on keeping on. Is that to say that nothing has gone bad in the share market? Is that like the shit? So we've hit another financial crisis like 2008. That wasn't even that bad. 2009. Nine. So the GFC, oh, this is such a convoluted topic. This is so much deeper than I thought we'd go. Um, Sorry. No, no, no. I (laughs) love it. Go back to talking Um, about your 14-year-old shoes. Excuse me. If those are the you. best things to ever no, happen great. to me. I want to know no, what brand they are. You left us hanging. Nude. Nude. N U D E. No, no, no. That's the brand. What colour are they? Mason, put they're in the black. show notes. They're okay. black boots. Victoria's boots are black. Um. Anyway. Exclusive. The people that lost money in the GFC predominantly were the people who got out because they were scared. And this is like about emotional investment, right? Like at the peak when people are really excited about an investment, and we are talking about this before, that's when the shares aren't worth that much because everyone's excited about it and the share price is inflated. But when the GFC happened, everything kind of bottomed out mm. and people were getting really scared. And instead of just riding the wave, which is what we really need to do, and that's what financial literacy affords you, is the understanding that, you know, that will hopefully bounce back, um, they got out. So their shares dropped from like $65 a share to $1 a share and they got out and then those shares have recovered so they would have been in better financial positions had they just stuck it out and actually mm. rode that wave, but they got out. So a lot of people lost a lot of money because they're like, shit, I'm just going to pull all my money out of my investment and put it in a savings account because in 2008, 2009, savings accounts were returning 6 7%. So that seemed better than what their share market was mm. returning. But then because the investment market went, you know, a bit bonkers, um, investment rates or – returns on savings accounts dropped and then they were getting nothing again. So it's more about riding the wave. And if you look at investment in Australia, if you are invested for a 30-year period, no one ever loses. Mm. Like no one who has been invested for that period of time has ever lost money because it always goes up. So, I'm not saying that that's a guarantee, mm-hmm. but like that if you look historically is what it looks like. So what happens, so if you put that 500 bucks a month, uh, aside and put it into an investment, when do you actually start seeing those dividends? Um, dividends are paid mm-hmm. depending on what the share is and how that works, quarterly, annually, however that works. So it, it makes sense, but this is about compounding interest. So like 
its power is actually in the very tail end of what happens with investment. So like the power is it compounds over time and, you know, when they say like a lily pad is covering 50% of the pond and it's been growing, you know, a double, what's it going to be tomorrow? much about lily pads. <laughs> no, no, neither. But go on. So a double, example. say it again. Yeah, I like it. Frogs on one. So if a, lily, if a, if a pond was 50% mm-hmm. covered in lily pads yeah. and it had been growing at the same rate each and every single day and it, you know, was growing at double, mm-hmm. how many days would it take? to cover the entire pond. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, that's one day. And that's how investment and compound interest works, right? So, like, the more you have and the longer you're invested, the faster it doubles. So, So like, in the first year, compound interest is, like, minimal. It's like, you know, you've got $1 and you've invested it and you got 10% return, so you got 10 cents. That's Mm -hmm. not great. But further down the line, you've invested $240,000 and you're at a $1.2 million portfolio. It's actually the power of money is in the time that you're invested, not how much you're investing. And so that uh, end game where you get when you've got a bunch of cash or it's paying you out 60 grand a year. Yeah. Is that based on every quarter or whenever you get those dividends that you're reinvesting? Yeah, so that money? you have to be reinvesting it. So if you've invested your five hundred dollars a month, mm-hmm. that is assuming that every dividend you've got has been reinvested sure. to compound. And so from a from a perspective of passive income, yep. what's the is Well, that depends on your values, yeah. right? So like you could be like sixty thousand dollars, that's great, but that might not work to sustain someone else's lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So they need to work backwards and work out what their investment amount needs to be to create the lifestyle they want. And for some people, $60,000 is perfect. And for some other people, they're like, well, Victoria, I need a yacht on the Mediterranean. You go, all right, well, let's make that happen. And for me, financial advice is very much about working backwards and going, all right, well, where do you want to be? And what's it going to take to create that? And so often do clients come across my table that they go, all right, I want this. You go, all right, well, if I work backwards, you need to be Mm. investing $5,000 a month. And they go, that's not possible. Okay, we need to realign your goals. And so renting, you have five, like, so say your rental place costs 500 bucks a week. Yeah. Yeah. that's cheap. Yeah. So, so where are you living, mate? Yeah, where are you living? Well, it's like, well, well we, he said we he pay was walking five, distance five, from here. We can totally yeah, track 50, this. 550 is what we pay. It's a very small place in Collingwood. Uh, if we Collingwood, use, you get to tell everybody that you live in Collingwood. Uh, it's great. You are so it's great. fancy. It's got a city view. It's great. It's lovely. Um, so say if it's 550 a week, mm-hmm. if it's, it sort of feels like in some ways it's like, oh, that five fifty, you know, rent money is dead money. I could be spending that. That is such a terrible excuse. No. I know. So that's did why you, I want Did you, you just get... tell me that you lived in Collingwood and it was great and you had city views? That's five fifty exactly. a week for yes. your lifestyle. Yeah. You can go live in Whoopal. That's cool. Is it aligned to and, your values? And so that, that's what I wonder. So, for instance, say from a mortgage perspective, on a five fifty a, a week place that's a, like a rental. Yeah. Say if that was, I don't know, what the fuck, what do you well, reckon our place you is? Well, you place costs- could you get your current house for five fifty mm-hmm. a week on a mortgage? Well, yeah, that's right. I don't, I don't think you that's could give them the location. No you had a 30% deposit or something. Like 50. Yeah. 50, yeah. yeah. 50 more. But at the same time, it's more along the lines of that's where rent vesting comes in, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of people are buying in locations so that they can afford and they feel like we'll have capital growth and returns and then living in the place that they want. Because what happens is if you buy over here and you own this house and you're paying that mortgage, the person that's living in that house is paying you rental income. And you take that money that that person is paying you in rental income and you pay your rent Mm -hmm. and it's kind of a no-sum game. And then because that's an investment for you, your mortgage repayments are actually tax deductible and you're in a better financial position having not lived in the property that you own because it's now an investment grade Mm -hmm. repayment and you can actually claim it on tax. So therefore, if you're claiming it on tax, you can actually afford to pay more of your mortgage off quicker. What about if you want to like pin things on the wall? No, just do it. Just Whatever. Yeah, no, 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 don't do that. Is that negative gearing? Is that no, no, no? Have that's they just that's all just them? rent vesting. Yeah. that's negative gearing, positive gearing. You know, neutrally gearing. They they haven't changed it, but they're talking mm-hmm. about it. But I really, really doubt. This is obviously quite wildly personal opinion, mm-hmm. but too many politicians have negatively geared properties for them to change the laws on that. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, look, because they've all got the seven beach houses. Yeah, exactly. And what about investing? 
Is there any reason to invest? Did you say invest egg or investing? In, I don't know. I probably said invest egg, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> There's nowhere he is right now. Invest it where I are love we? eggs, in, honestly. Yeah, they are a but miracle you food. You, <laughs> no, you already yeah, answered this. That was a joke. Are you okay? Um, have I'm you fine. already forgotten my but egg conversation? The, fi- the, f- the final one. Is there any reason to invest if you have any form of debt? No, it no, be absolutely hex not. Or oh, no, not hex. hex. Hex is out. Okay. So hex is a debt that you don't accrue interest on. Mm-hmm. So it's interest free. It does in, like it Us increases. Us don't have hex anyway. But oh, well, yeah, so you're going to go to so. uni to get hex. Yeah, exactly. did, we, did we just talk about yeah. how much study I did? Like, yeah. Can oh, you yeah, imagine how terrifying my hex is? Like I I'm see. pretty sure like this is not public knowledge, but now okay. it is. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. My hex debt is six figures and that's terrifying. Six figures. So six that figure means. Hex debt. So that's over 100,000. That's not crazy. Whoa! Did you work the hundred thousand dollar thing out yourself? Yeah, I did. I, I nearly went to a. I nearly went to a million because you know six zeros. Sometimes. <laughs> no, no, no. Amy's, got, Amy's got like five grand left. My wife. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we're gonna get like an extra hundred and twenty bucks a fortnight when yep. that Once finishes it, oh, very handy. soon. Which is it's actually a lot of money. Yeah. It, look, it is a lot of money, years, but yeah. at the same time, you're not accruing interest on that debt, and you're only paying inflation on that debt. And to me. Like this is absolutely well and truly not personal advice, but mm-hmm. to me, my money is better spent, invested than paying off my hex debt yeah. because inflation's at what one point eight, one point nine each year, and the return of the share market is on average seven point five percent. So I'd prefer that the money that I have coming in via my cash flow to be invested in the share market and performing a bit better, mm. and I'll just pay off my hex debt over the longer term. Um, but that's personal opinion. That's just what I do. Some people just don't like the idea of debt. Um, but if you have personal debt, if you have a mortgage, like that is an investment in itself to pay off because for you to, like say you have personal debt mm-hmm. and the average is like what, 17% on a personal loan, depending on what loan you've got. But like for you to invest instead of paying off your personal debt, that investment has to return more than 17% mm-hmm. for it to be worth it. And What about the psychology not, not of this sort of thing? Because, you know, you took like there's the whole snowball, like Ramit Sethi I think talks about that. Like, yeah, and like snowball, Dave Ramsey yeah, and stuff. Yeah, snowballing yeah. debts. I, th- I think that's good and it's a really good mental strategy to mm-hmm. get things off the list and if you are in significant debt, which is, do you know what? It is what it is. Mm-hmm. It's fine. If you're in significant personal debt, call it. Just be like, all right, I'm in debt. What am I going to do moving forward? Get out of debt is your priority. Like I just don't think that investing is a thing that you should be prioritizing because if you are, it's actually putting you back financially because it's like you're putting money over here, but you're actually accruing more interest mm-hmm. over here and it's just like a no sum game. What about good debt versus bad debt? Specifically, I guess as we the start- mindset, mate. Yeah, yeah. But yeah the, the jet <laughs> good ski. Good debt. I got a handbag and a jet ski. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah well, I guess and I like, use them both at the same time. Well, so oh, no. wow. <laughs> yeah. no, so I just, you are from Dramana, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Safety no. beach, babe. No, hey, I, hey. <laughs> That I used just, to be called Shark Bay. Did it? Yeah. Safety Beach. Safety Beach used name. to be called Shark yeah, Shark's Bay. Got a bad branding. Now. Bad branding. Yeah. Legitimately, it was bad branding. <laughs> yeah. They wanted more tourists. It's worked. Wow. Oh, that works really well. Yeah. I don't know if it's any safer. But um, bad debt versus, versus good debt, I can see that where our business is going, where we want to eventually get to, we say, okay, there's huge amounts of investment that we put in ourselves but potentially there's accessing of debt to be able to fund certain yeah. things. How does how, how do people do this when it comes to mindset? Because if you've just gone through life where it's like debt is bad. Yeah. Talk to a financial yeah. advisor, get some advice. Mm-hmm. Like I think it's actually quite a powerful thing to be empowered in the decisions you're making and not just going, oh, it feels like the right thing. Mm. Um, like good versus... Good debt versus bad debt. Bad debt is things that don't actually impact your future wealth, Mm -hmm. whereas good debt are things that increase your future wealth. Um, And a car loan, not that. Mm -hmm. An investment in a business where you are anticipating it to have a positive return, well, that's something that you really do need to consider. So just because I'm a financial advisor does not mean I'm against debt. I'm against the the wrong types of debt. I'm against credit cards and, you know, personal loans, but I'm not against going, all right, well, I've got this really good business idea and I am going to grow it this way. And I've got a really great business plan that surrounds me. And for me to actually get where I'm going, I need to take on debt because that would be really naive of me to say, because I've done that to create my business. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way I came up with the capital to start Zella and to start She's on the Money without taking on some pretty significant risk because Mm -hmm. without risk, you don't have good return. 
Do you think that that's a conversation that's not had publicly enough? Oh, no, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Like we, we all see these startups and people being like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. It's like, well... What have you like? What risk have you taken to be in this position? Mm -hmm. Because you don't get the growth that you get without taking on some level of risk, and risk is often debt. Mm -hmm. She's on the money. Your podcast, a, a content play for you um, in business. I think pe people that are business owners making the decision to start creating something like a podcast. Do you see this? This is yeah, no, three. Three. <laughs> three. Three. Okay The bottle is no. born. Are you yeah. kidding me? Between Between three 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 sorry to interrupt there. More. I just feel like everybody's a public <laughs> service announcement. Do you want to a bit more or no? No, no. No, I'm no you're good. Do you want you something? Should, no, finish it off, big boy. No, no, no. It's all yours. Um, We've still got the other it's bottle. It's not organic, though. He might be disappointed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he'll like sneak flushed, the other bottle out when he walks yeah. out too. Yeah. No, like, well, I'll, I'll just, just take this home. I, I feel bit. like this needs to be a thing. I feel like our conversation has got better yeah. over time, I just like be, a fine wine. Yeah, yeah. Which uh, the South, I've got to say, I've turned around with the South Island. It's a beautiful wine, <laughs> beautiful drop. <laughs> And Do you know for, what? For, for under 20 they bucks. Should, <laughs> honestly, they should sponsor you. Send yeah. a case. Yeah, send a case. Yeah. Send, send a case. Send a we'll we'll case. We'll we'll take a case. <laughs> um, make it, uh, so. I'm embarrassed to be me today. <laughs> no, so honestly, uh, what have you done? <laughs> investing in creating content for invest your business. Invest in wine. Yeah, invest yeah. in wine. It's, the content's a different thing. But no, investing in creating content, which at the start makes no real sense for most people. Yeah. Uh, what is it? What's that journey been like for you in hindsight now that you've created something quite amazing? I didn't mean to do that, and I'd be naive to say that I did that on my own. Um, She's on the money came out of a space where I was running these workshops called She's on the Money, and I wanted a space where the women who were attending these workshops could network and ask the questions that they'd forgotten to ask in my workshops. And so I created a Facebook group, and it got a bit confused when other people who hadn't attended my workshops that were joining. And then I thought, all right, well, did you this have is questions on Facebook? So we have some stringent questions we ask. We do when people. What What do you ask? I ask for your email address. Oh, that's a good one. We should yeah. have done that. Data collection is. Yeah, key. yeah, that's right. They've given it because I think I'm a part of it. All right. Well, oh, great. Do you get my newsletter? I might have put a bogus one in. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that is a low blow, oh, no, no, especially no, no. from you. No, no, no. I'm trying to think. Do I, I have your email. I'm adding it. Just yeah, check. Can you do. just search your list? <laughs> yeah, I can. Be, so that's um, it. So you ask that. So you ask, so for, I ask the name. for your yeah. email. I ask what your location is mm -hmm. because originally I actually thought it would only be Melbourne based people mm -hmm. and I haven't updated my questions. Yeah. Um, and the third thing I ask is what do you want to get out of this group? Um, and a lot of people are like, oh, I just want to talk about money more or I want answers to this or that. And that initially really drove what content I created in the Facebook group. And to be honest, in hindsight, it sounds like I've been really strategic, but it kind of was all by accident. Mm. Um, and that's not to say I haven't been really purposeful in the decisions I've been making, but I absolutely didn't go, all right, she's on the money is going to be this thing. It's going to be a movement. It's going to be all these things I want it to be, which I do but I never thought I was pop. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't think I was capable of creating that. Um, and so we started growing this community and the podcast actually came out of me saying to the community like, hey, I've actually – so I finished a 12-week course of content with them where I every week picked a topic and I would post on Monday about that topic and then on Wednesday I'd post a little activity that I get they could do and I used to get, um, you know, my friends to comment on the posts. Yeah. Oh, great. Hey, That's a good one. Hey, well, excuse me, you, Tommy, can you please um, <laughs> comment on my post so it looks like people care? I'm constantly doing that. I got, every time I do a LinkedIn, I'm at everyone, every, hey, everyone on Slack. Hey, you comment on everything of mine. No. Yeah. <laughs> what is the deal? Like, so when it just on that course thing. Yeah. Because we, we have a lot of reservation. We've already paid uh, one month or two months for Podia. We need to get that going. Oh, I didn't pay for that subscription. Whoops. No, that's a big media company. No, it's on the second one. No, no, but is it not? Uh, yeah, I set that up. Even though I feel uh, so we, oh, you're passing. Okay, yeah, I didn't. Yeah, and no, so yeah. um, we we want to do our podcast training, but we have this like expectation of what we need to do. What has you, been your learning in regards to what people actually need from training versus what's created in your head as the person I who's ask them. So training. I'm so lucky. This community that we've created has been so responsive. So that's where I posted on the Facebook group and I said, what do you want from me? Like, you know, we've created this 12 week and it was just a Facebook post and it was just like a PDF that they could download. It wasn't anything too exciting. And I said to them, what do you want? And I did this like poll and all of them voted video content and then like secondary to that, it was a podcast. I was like, well, I'm not ready for video. <laughs> I'm just totally not ready for that. 
but I felt like I could probably do a podcast. And so I reached out to a couple of people that were doing well at a podcast and said to them, like, how do I do this? What do I do? This is the content I want to create. This is what I want to format. And this is the information that I want to get across. And they helped me create that and had no idea what I was doing at the start. And they did. And then it's kind of grown from there. And the podcast has been this voice that's been able to get this movement across. And it's become just that. It's a movement. And I'm ridiculously proud of it. But it's also come from a place where I just wanted people to be better at money. Mm -hmm. It didn't come from a place where I was like, I'm going to create another business because Lord knows I did not need that. Like I've got Zella. That is more than enough time. I'm how now long Zella, How long have you been doing Zella for? Four and a half years. Mm -hmm. Four and a half years. And so what what does the four and a half year mark look like compared to a year in? What have you learned about the health of businesses based on running your own? Um, a lot. A lot of it is just trial and error. Um, I'm thankfully in a position now where I can really see what I want to create and how I want to create it. Um, and yeah, it's one of those things where I didn't understand a lot about this industry before entering it. And now I'm seeing it and I'm just going, oh, wow, like maybe I should have mm. done this mm -hmm. differently or that differently. But you know what? It is what it is. Mm -hmm. When they say businesses, most businesses don't make it past third year, is it? Second year? I've heard that. What what do you think, what is a, I mean, it's not true for you, but what is the thing that usually collapses most businesses or, or that you've seen? Um, actually anticipating cash flow and maybe not being as committed to their passion and their vision as they, they should have been. I think that, oh, this sounds so awful, but I feel like a lot of people get into business because it's really shiny and they want to start a business and they, you know, might start a retail company and then they realise it's actually all too hard. So mm. I think the most important thing to consider is if you are thinking about starting a business is take everything into consideration. Sit down with an accountant, work out what your 10-year plan is, mm. not just what your one-year plan is um, and work out what that actually looks like in the long term because, 10 years from now, like, are you going to be big? If so, what does that look like? And mm. put yourself in a position to scale because I think that's the thing that a lot of businesses shoot their shoot themselves in the foot over is actually just not being in a position where they can scale and grow their business. And when I say that, I'm not talking about going from like $500 return to $5 million. I'm talking about, you know, just even going from $500 return to $100,000 and what does that take and how does that work and how do you put, set yourself up mm. So that as the business owner, you are not the only person that that business is relying on. What was the biggest stretch that you made? So for us, I guess, like uh, taking on bigger leases or doing those sorts of things. Like there, are, it seems like there's those pivotal, Scary, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, pivotal moments where it's like. CBD rent is really mm -hmm. expensive. I'm telling you right yeah. now. Um, I think it was actually for me realizing that I can't be everything to everybody. And mm -hmm. I really needed to pull myself back on some parts of my business and let people do what they're good at instead of going, but that's my thing. Mm -hmm. um, and pulling myself back on that so that I could then focus on the things that are future planning. And, you know, she's on the money has really played into that because prior to this, I was just seeing clients every single day. I was going into mm. financial advice meetings day in, day out, and now it's like, well, actually, someone else can do that. And the best piece of advice I actually got was from um, Morgan again. Honestly, mm -hmm. I've told you, one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Um, and she said, you need to only do the things that only you can do. Um, and for me, that was kind of pivotal in changing the way that I saw things. And if someone can do it, like, find a way to make that happen. And that sounds very entitled, I know, because... I'm very lucky to be in a position where I now have a team behind me. So at the start, you actually just have to do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. But once you get to a stage where you're growing, being able to let go of the things that you might love but someone else can do has been the biggest thing that's helped us grow. How do you let go? Look, I haven't. I've just, yeah. I've just said I do. No. <laughs> um, I, th I think it's about finding a team that you trust mm -hmm. and people that you really want your community to be made up of and people that you feel as though actually carry your vision and carry the things that you want to achieve in mm. the longer term. And for me, I'm so, so lucky that I found those people. Um, but for people who haven't found that, you often do have to carry on and keep doing those things. But for me, to be able to take my business to the next level was stepping out and going, well, actually, I can't always take client meters. Mm -hmm. I can't spend my time here because I need to be building shoes on the money. I need to be talking about content. I need to be doing those things that only I can do. 
Are you doing anything right now that doesn't make sense for you to do, but you believe strongly? Oh, absolutely. I moderate my own Facebook group. (laughs) Like I love that. (laughs) It makes no sense for me to be doing that, Uh but it's one of my favorite things. And like seeing all of my community come together and like post their money wins and their money confessions. I don't think people think that it's me Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, we do have a team. We do have, you know, I've got really great team that actually helped me do that, but I'm still in there Mm -hmm. every day approving posts and approving people into the community because I just want to be a part of it. Yeah. And it's like when people like start restaurants, it's like you need to be in every part of the business to under- properly understand yep. things. And mm-hmm. I guess that is the the Facebook community is such a good representation of where everything is, where the community yep. is. Yeah. And I don't think I'll ever lose that. Mm-hmm. Like as much as we, mo- like I'm actually looking for a community manager at the moment, someone that can run all of that and, you know, do my events and do the things that I'm doing that I know I can outsource. Um, but I don't think I'll lose that. I think mm-hmm. I'm always going to be a little bit... Um, sassy and just jump in and do their work mm-hmm. for them because oh, that. for me I love that like mm-hmm. we're this strong community and there's like nearly 50,000 women in this group now and there's 250,000 comments and conversations going on every single month and that's crazy like I just desperately want to be a part of it yeah that's a lot of conversations so good well um Thank you for coming in for our first oh, wine. Thank fr- you for wine having Friday. me. And cheers yeah. to that. I'm you have an empty glass. Um, yeah, I'm absolutely yeah, blotto. Yeah, cheers, friends. I'll still cheers. give it an empty glass. Cheers. It's not the first person cheers. on this episode to do that. What did, what did you I say? I just saw you sipping in on an empty glass. Yeah. Was I doing that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the um, I actually had, I remember I had some red wine doing, uh, we we went to, to Sydney oh, and we had Richard right. Wilkins uh, on the show and we went oh, to he's his. much cooler than me. Yeah. Well, no, he was, we went to his own private bar at his house and so he poured me a wine and um i have a cupboard where i keep a bottle of gin is that oh really yeah Yeah, come on over it has vibes did you ever watch um the uh, morning wars on apple tv uh, tv plus but i feels like they're always got spirits like they're always like i just i'm so good at gin yes yeah rock on over i don't know if i've had gin before you're gonna have it right what you're gonna have it right he's never had a really drink yeah Jink. I he I doesn't say really jink. drink, but the, he's um, sunk three glasses in this. Well, session. no, he, he's only All just right. started drinking in his life, and so I wine is that. his entry. And All so right. the um, he's a bit yucky. Gin, we can, gin is, we can introduce is it to clear? a gin and tonic. Is gin clear? Gin is clear. Getting some really nice well, cucumber, it doesn't have like to a be. vodka. I, I never thought no, it, it like, tastes nothing like vodka. Please don't offend gin by likening it to vodka, and don't let the tonic water put you off. Because a lot of people don't like tonic water because they're thinking it's soda water. I think I don't know if I. I respect the fact that I came on this show, given you don't drink gin, honestly. <laughs> I I'll get around it. But no, the, um, I think you would actually like a gin and tonic with a nice bit of cucumber, little those baby oh, yeah. little cucumbers. You know what? I'll send you like a like small you. bottle of gin and you can give it a crack. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the the ghost, uh, Ghostbusters guy has his own gin. Can you look that up, Sevs? It's in a skull. I think that's vodka. He's the that's UFO. Vodka. I'm pretty sure, sure that um, the skull no, 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 no. Oh, he's the guy who doesn't drink gin trying to correct us. I reckon I, I am a seasoned vodka. drinker. Type I reckon it's vodka because I've listened to the Joe Rogan episode with him on it talking about how it's like. It's a different type of vodka then. Yeah, but just a different type yeah, of vodka it's, it's isn't gin. gin. It's I with filtered that. water. Yeah, yeah, all that bullshit. No, but anyway. but let's just find out. Crystal surf. head vodka. Yeah, it's, it's vodka. vodka. Okay. Yeah. Right. Victoria Devine, thank you for coming thank on the show. No problem. Uh, thank money. you for having me, the, friends. Uh, you're doing the one on. Um, What's it called? Next, next <laughs> week. Oh, no. You are awful pay at rises. this. Pay rises. Pay rises. Yeah, yes. next week. Apple you want to pay rises? Reviews. Let's call it Show Me the Money. Show Me the Money's good. I like Show Me the Money. Show Me the Money. Did you already think of that before No, I today? legitimately didn't. Okay, I'll have a think it's about It's not even a song lyric, I don't believe. I think it's a movie lyric. We're never getting Tommy back Cruise. together. Yeah. What song's that? If, I don't know if that's Taylor appropriate. Swift. A Taylor Swift, Swift song yeah, would, be, would be good. I'll come up with something. You, ca- you come back to me anyway, on that one. Great. And you'll right. forget us. How you <laughs> <laughs> it's you the Daily Talk Show. Uh, hi at thedailytalkshow.com is the email address and we'll see you tomorrow. See you guys.